I had some interesting roommates in college. One was from Santa Cruz, California. And that's a, quite a place, that's Santa Cruz. And I was from Hooker, Oklahoma at the time. And I had never been to California, let alone Santa Cruz. Now, Santa Cruz is a pretty exclusive place. And my roommate was Bart Clanton. Sounded like one of the Clanton gang. And he was quite an amazing guy. I was 20 by then, and he was 18, maybe 17. He was a young freshman. And he had never been away from home. And I remember in the room, it was like we'd do our laundry together, and we'd just throw it all in there. We didn't care what color it was or whether it was white or what. We just threw it all into one deal, and we'd wash it. And sometimes our, our white shirts would come out purple and, and whatever. We'd have black stripes on something here and there from the new socks or whatever. And, we didn't even care. I mean, he really didn't care. I cared a little. It kind of, you know, a little bit on me, but he didn't care at all. And here's what was even worse. We'd do our laundry, and, and I'm, I'm just really, you know, confession is good for the soul. So I'm, I'm acknowledging some of my uh, weaknesses. And uh, we'd do our laundry, and we'd bring it back up to the room. We lived on the 11th floor of a 12-story dormitory. And we, we'd bring it back up to the room, and we'd just dump it in the middle of the room and leave it there. And whenever we needed something, we'd just grab it in the pile and pull it out. And we were both the same size. We actually, we, actually, we, we both were like 6'4", and, and we had the same kind of body build. And, and even if I was, even, and, and, and Bart, that rascal, he would literally wear stuff for two or three days and throw it back in the pile. <laughs> so I had to develop some good old factory senses, you know, some good smell. But that's what happens when you go away to college sometimes. And you get stuck with a roommate from Santa Cruz because those guys didn't, you know. And I remember my first trip to California. This is just a little addendum here, just a little extra. I, was a, I wasn't a Christian yet, but I was going on a pilgrimage looking for who God might be. And... He took me surfing in the cold waters just barely south of San Francisco Bay. And he gave me a 12-foot surfing board. Now, anybody who knows anything knows that that's a big surfing board. I mean, boats are 12 feet long. And, and what he didn't tell me was there were great white sharks in that water most of the time. And... Uh, Anyway, we grow up and we experience things that are amazing. The sermon is sorting your laundry. Now, Christians, we, we, we know how to sort our laundry. Well, we think we do. We don't really. At least I don't. Maybe you do. But I'm talking about our spiritual laundry. And, and Romans chapter 1 has some serious spiritual laundry and some serious challenges in sorting out that laundry. And we're going to look at that quickly here and enjoy our communion for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Somebody say with me, all of you, all ungodliness. And unrighteousness of men, mankind is what that word represents, of mankind, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, how many, how many people in the human race suppress the truth in unrighteousness? Well, if you know Romans 3, you know it's all of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all condemned Jesus with our sins on the cross. This is talking about all of us, folks. The, you know, we're all in this laundry basket. We're all in the same boat. He's referring to all of us. And, and uh, I've seen this before, but I've never seen it this deeply the Lord's making it more deep in my soul and more humbling and more sobering than I've ever experienced reading Romans. And, and seeing this, actually, I, I've been reading it, reading it, reading it, and it just sinks in deeper and deeper and deeper. Isn't it exciting to learn from God? Amen. It's exciting just to learn anything, right, that's worth learning. It's just incredible. And as you look at this, 
Every one of us have suppressed the truth at one time or another with our unrighteousness. We have encouraged others to be unrighteous when we are unrighteous, when we've been unrighteous, when we've done things that are not right. We've, we've, we've given them the idea that, well, he's doing it, and I guess I can do it too. And that's, that's part of what God's talking to. I mean, he, he knows how to let us know what's really real. Because what may be known of God is manifested in the, all these people, in them, in them, in all human beings. For God has shown it to them, plural, all mankind. There, no one will have any excuses that when that day arrives after the thousand years and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven and there's a lot of people, in fact, Jesus reveals that most of the human race are going to be outside looking in. And that's sad, but Jesus said it, not me. And, and no one will be able to say, nobody ever told me about this. No one gave me a Bible study. No one showed me this. No one explained. There will be no one able to do that. Because God has revealed it himself personally to every human being. He says so right here. And it's also in, J in John chapter 1 that God lightens every soul that comes into the world. He personally makes sure that we all know who he is on, on that lowest common denominator at that basic elementary stage, he introduces himself. He, he, he says so right here. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understand, understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now there's a lot of reasons why people don't allow Jesus to heal them. But there are no good excuses why we don't let Jesus heal us. And that's how easy it is to get in. Just say, yes, Lord, come into my life and lead me in your way, eternal. So, <clears throat> Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. That's a major key. Just being thankful is an evidence that you're acknowledging God, that you appreciate God, that you appreciate life, that you appreciate what you, you, what you're, what you have, anything. This is a real thermometer, how thankful you are. And, and you know, it's really important how thankful you are when you're all alone. Do, I mean, do you just do you sing songs of thanksgiving to God when you're all alone? Thank you for the cross, Lord. If everything in your life completely goes down the tubes, and if everything goes wrong, I'm saying the worst, the worst you, any human existence could be, you've still got all you need to be thankful. You've still got Jesus. You've still got his work on the cross. And that outweighs everything, everything that could go wrong. Being thankful for the gift of Jesus. And being so excited and so thankful about it that you, that you can't let people go by you in your life without trying to tell them how awesome it is to have Jesus. Trying to figure out how can I explain this a little better than last time. How, maybe I can come up, maybe Lord you can give me some little, little tidbit that I can get their attention with the next time I see them. I know God loves you that much. He loves me that much. And the more we let him in, the more we're going to love each other the way he loves us. It's just beautiful how simple he makes it. And he says, they were not thankful, but became futile, vain in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, this is not your typical 
communion sermon, folks. And I tried to get out of this sermon. As late as 1035, I was still trying to get out of this sermon. And I even talked to one of our members to say, hey, be ready in case the Lord lets me out of this. And I get, did, did, did. Well, it ain't happening. I got to preach this. Because it's getting ready to get worse. And I don't think any human being is qualified to read what I'm getting ready to read. I don't think there's any human being qualified to get to read what I'm getting ready to read. It's only by the grace of God that I can even stand up here and breathe without completely losing my grip on life. This is heavy stuff. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things and four and, and jets and helicopters and four-wheel drive SUVs or whatever, you know, and, and uh, uh, footballs and baseballs and basketballs and baseballs. And, did I say baseballs? Well, that's twice. Those guys are a little more, you know, soccer balls. We, do, we, we come up with so many idols, it's not even funny. We are the idol generation, not I-D-L-E, the I-D-O-L. We've got so many toys and so many ways to bring earthly pleasure to ourselves. We, just, we, we can't even build big enough storage sheds and garages to hold it all. People are getting rich on just renting spaces for all of our toys to be sitting. And some of these are important to have. I think it's good to have a motorhome. I don't know if I'd buy a $250,000 motorhome because there's quite a few of those in California. I couldn't believe the first time I came to California. I couldn't believe. I went to Newport Harbor, fresh off the farm in Hooker, Oklahoma. I went to Newport Harbor, and I saw yachts that were more expensive than my whole town. Five to ten million dollar yachts. And it wasn't just one yacht. It was like 50 and 60 others. I said, how in the world can there be that much money here? And those ten million dollar yachts were sitting in front of 50 million dollar houses. That's more than the whole state of Oklahoma. Well, maybe not. There's a lot of oil over there. But you think about this. This is talking about all of us. We are all in this description here. God's not talking about them. He's talking about us and we. And it even gets more clear as we go. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Do you know God compares gluttony to the same thing as any other disgusting sin? That's a little bit ouchy. Because I don't know too many defensive linemen who aren't gluttonous. I was a defensive lineman, and we were encouraged to be gluttonous because they wanted us to weigh 380 pounds so we could knock down the other team. The quarterbacks, they weren't gluttonous because they were the pretty boys. And we, and they, you know, we had to protect them, right? <laughs> Same thing in basketball. You can't play basketball if you're a 400-pounder. You can't get off the floor. But just because the basketball players aren't gluttonous doesn't mean they're not gluttons. Some of them wish they could be eating like the defensive linemen. And Jesus says, if you wish it in your heart to the point to where you just crave it all the time, it's the same as if you're doing it. So just because you're not doing something doesn't mean you've escaped idolatry. Coveting something bad enough to where you wish you could is the same thing. Now, 
You can straighten it out and put that little piece of laundry over here. That laundry's not as dirty as the laundry that uh, Solomon had when he was sacrificing his babies to Moloch. His is really dirty. His idolatry is just filthy idolatry. My idolatry is not as dirty as your idolatry. <laughs> and don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. We uh, have all done this. Every one of us. I can look down my nose at your dirty laundry, but I'm not looking that bad down on my own laundry. In fact, if I throw my laundry in the middle of your pile, how dare you not put my laundry on next day, the next day? It's going to get tougher here. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Now we come past tense. Exchanged. Now he's talking about some event in the past. And I don't need to go into that. If, if you don't understand what that just said, you email me or text me and I'll point you to the Bible what he's talking about. Because it gets even clearer. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. That's the extreme. That's when you have totally blasphemed the Holy Spirit out of your life, and it, it'll talk about that in a few minutes, and it's a terrible situation, but we are all in line for this when we're born. We all have the same sinful nature as anybody else has on this planet. Yours is not cleaner. You don't go over here in the clean laundry, the, well, the clean, dirty laundry. And I, I'm not over here in the clean, uh, the dirty, dirty laundry. And that's hard for us to admit. Pharisees have a real hard time with this. My sins aren't as dirty as yours. Your sins may have killed Jesus, but not mine. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased, reprobate is the King James mind, to do these, those things which are not fitting. God gives them over. And he won't do that unless you have really gone really bonkers with grieving the Holy Spirit, cursing and resisting and violating the Holy Spirit. That's something that just boggles my mind. And I just pray that God will just pour on me grace after grace after grace so great that I will never even get close to the edge of that ice. Because you've got to be really cold-hearted to say no to Jesus to the extreme where God has to let you go. Unbelie it's not unbelievable, but it's almost unbelievable. Being filled with all unrighteousness, not, not just a little, but all unrighteousness. When you commit the unpardonable sin, the only sin that cannot be forgiven, you will become all unrighteous, demon-possessed, possessed of evil to an extreme that is so sad that even God can't reach you because he has let you go. Haven't met very many people like that. But if we live long enough, we're going to get to see a whole bunch of people like that. It's called the mark of the beast. And you can't receive the mark of the beast unless you've committed the unpardonable sin. And that's going to be really bizarre. I used to think how exciting I'd like to live through the time of trouble. But you know, the more I learn about it, the more I'm saying, Lord, you may just want to let me go to sleep. I think we'll see how that works out. And here's the unrighteousness that he's talking about. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, there's the idolatry, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, that's gossip is included there. Jesus calls gossip murder. Strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whispers. There's, he's doubling up on that. Backbiters, it seems like gossip, gossip is a real killer. Jesus really 
magnifies gossip too when he was here. And I always think, well, what's so, what's so bad about gossip? I think, you know, other things would be a lot worse, but it's a killer. Whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Now, I know we are all guilty. And somebody says, disobedient to parents? That can't be as dirty as, as that one. Disobedient to parents? That can't be as dirty as, as gossiping. Well, that's where God puts it. In the same dirty clothes basket. <laughs> so I kind of think it's a, I, th- I kind of like God's uh, method of doing laundry. He puts us all in the same basket and says, don't look down on each other. Don't judge each other. He says it over and over through the book of Romans. It's incredible. It's one of, it's one of uh, God's major themes in the book of Romans. Don't condemn each other. That's amazing. Undiscerning. Don't know, don't understand what's good for them. Untrustworthy. Unloving. Uh Uh-oh. Unforgiving. Unmerciful. He puts that in the same basket. If you're doing that, or if you're untrustworthy, you're capable of anything else in the list. Oh, I, yeah, well, I've got this weakness, but I would never do that. Really? Do we learn anything from Peter? Do we learn anything from Peter? Oh, I would never do that, Lord. I would never deny you, Lord. There's, there's a couple of things we should learn in life, and one of them is don't ever say you won't do something and don't ever say you will do something because the one son said, oh, yeah, I'll go work for you today. And the other one said, no, i got a party to go to. I'm going to town. Well, the one that said he was going, oh, I'm going to work for you, Dad, and I'm going to make you the proudest dad in the world, and I'm going to be your favorite son, he took off and went partying. He didn't do what he said. And the other guy said, oh, I'm going to party, Dad. On the way to the party, Oh, man, I shouldn't have talked to Dad that way. And he goes back and he works all day for Dad. (laughs) I see myself too much in here. This is scary stuff if you don't have Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus and you're not scared, then somebody needs to make sure you're awake. And that's what we're doing here. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving to die. Eternal death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. They cheer them on. They encourage them. If you're, if you're trying to get better at sin, the people around you who are trying to get better at sin are just cheering you on. Here, take another drink. Pop another pill. Let's go to another crazy situation. Let's go do something wild. Here's three things that I noticed in these even verses, 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debased mind, reprobate. There's three steps there. You, when you get there and you get there, you, you better start looking for the brake pedal. And if you can't find it, ask God to help you find it. How do I turn around, Jesus? Show me the brakes. I'm I'm going down this tube, these tubes. I have no idea what what I'm doing. Please help me. And this is why Paul was so excited about the gospel. In the positive, he would have said, I am so proud and I'm so excited about the gospel because it saves me from myself. It saves me from my sins, from my sins. Not Adam's sin. Yeah, it saves us from Adam's sins. But until you own it personally and say, I'm so excited for the gospel because it saves me from my sins. I'm not going to blame Adam for anything because I've done the same thing he did and worse. 
That's why it's so exciting to stand up for Jesus every chance we get. That's why it's so exciting to get baptized. That's when you're standing up for Jesus. When you get that opportunity, grab it. He's worthy. He's worthy. And all the people around you who haven't been baptized, if you, if you get baptized, they go, wow, maybe God wants me too. Maybe God will let me in this thing. Maybe I can actually do this too if, if so-and-so can do it. Who knows how God is using your baptism when you do that? Or communion. Anytime we can do something in the footsteps of Jesus, it's, it, it's, it's, it's uh, multiplying and increasing the influence of heaven all around us. Amen. It's so awesome what God has done. The power of God to move mountains. The mountains of fear and worry and confusion and ignorance and doubt and all those mountains, it, it just, boom, it blows them out of our lives when Jesus comes in. The gospel does all that. That's real. And it's all there. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. This, talk, this is talking about growing and increasing and maturing. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This word live means like a, like a, like a, like a tree. You plant a tree. And you fertilize the tree. And you, that's Bible study. You, you water the tree. That's prayer, receiving the Holy Spirit. And you prune the tree. That's serious. Because that hurts sometimes. But you got this tree, and this is talking about growing. This is live. This word live means you, you grow by faith. You not only get saved by faith, you learn and grow and you, you mature. And you, you, and you know what? They're going to plant trees tomorrow morning at Dan Maddox's house. I was wondering when I was gonna, how I was going to get this announcement in here. Because they, they texted me from upstairs and said, hey, they're planting a tree over at Dan's house tomorrow. And could you announce that? Because they're going to show the best way to plant a tree as, as uh, presented by the green thumb, Ellen White herself. She has the best method that, that I've found for planting trees. And Dan, I hope you success, brother. Because if that tree doesn't produce a lot of fruit, they're going to know you did something wrong. Anyway, if you want to meet him, you talk to him. Dan, come up here. I want everybody to turn around. He's way up there. He, they can't see you, Dan. Anyway, talk to Dan. But Jesus definitely knows how to plant trees. And Psalms 1 says, the righteous are like a tree planted beside the waters. Now, maybe you've never washed anybody's feet. And maybe you won't wash anybody's feet today. That, that's not going to upset and cause God any concern. But it's an opportunity, if you'd like, to go to the gym and wash somebody's feet. Or if you're real brave, have somebody wash your feet. But God understands. If you've never done that, he may take a few weeks, months. He may even take years to, to get you okay with that. That's between you and him. But here's an opportunity today to walk in his footsteps and, and, and to learn what did Jesus experience when he did that or why did he do that? And why, do, why did he ask me to do that? In John, he says, as you have seen me do to you guys, if you've seen me do to you, each of you, you should do to each other. Now, you can believe that in the first century, but Jesus is the God of the present right now. And what he said to all those crazy disciples, and they were, some of them were crazier than I am, I think. At least I hope. Maybe not. But anyway, whatever he said to them is for me. He told them they could move mountains if they had a mustard seed of faith. I own that. I purchased that. I purchased that faith with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's all paid for, and I, it's mine. 
And if you don't have yours, all you need to do is say, thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for shedding your blood for me, Jesus. And boom, he installs his faith into you. If you're, if, you're, if you're sick and tired of running on human faith and human power, then you came to the right place here today because the faith of Jesus is here today. Because he's here. And what he has, he gives to all. If you just want to come and watch, it's really actually pretty cool to watch people wash each other's feet. And I can almost guarantee you won't find any dirty feet over there today. Because we sure don't want people washing our dirty feet. We don't want them to know that we, we don't want them to know we even have any dirt. But we all got it. But he owns that. Jesus owns my sins. Because he bought my sins with his blood. Does he own yours? That's the biggest question you will ever answer. There is no question larger than this one question. Who has your sins? You or Jesus? As we go to serve, the men will go into the gym and it's the first right corner. The women into the gym, it's the left corner over to the far left corner. Couples and families in the far right corner of the gym. And, and, and this may be totally new to you, but I hope you at least come and watch because it even, even video it. You can take pictures, you know. And uh, who knows? Most Christian churches used to do this up until a couple, three, four hundred years ago. They were all doing it. And then they started drifting. Well, maybe I don't need to do that word. Maybe I don't need to do this word. But Jesus says, if you're a doer of my word, your faith will rise in you like the noonday sun. God bless you as you go to serve. The Lord is with us. He is mighty to save. We shall live and never die. God bless you as you go to serve each other in the service of humility and return for the table of the Lord.